Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second Benjamin the Exotics Reptile Podcast. And in today's podcast, I want to talk to you guys about, and the main subject we're going to be doing today is spider ball pythons. Now, this is not going to be necessarily a video or a podcast about spider ball python wobble in terms of the arguments of who's right, you know, should we breed them, should we not breed them. This is not going to be about that. Today, I want to talk about basically the biggest problem with banning spiderball pythons okay because the way it's being framed and the way that it's been framed in most of the videos that i've seen so far is people will basically give this argument you know they'll talk about businesses you know if we didn't regulate big businesses they would do all kinds of things to destroy the natural environment to take resources to mess up the planet because they're just greedy and they only want money and then they incorrectly in my own opinion reflect that onto the ball python market and they talk about spider ball pythons in that same light and the reasoning seems to be that oh we as breeders cannot uh, effectively manage our own animals so we need to literally be regulated by an outside maybe governmental force that comes in and regulates the spider ball pythons now there are so many problems with this but the first thing i want to talk about in the real there's two main problems okay what i just talked about with the whole wanting to ban spider ball pythons and the whole legal problems we're going to talk about but that's going to be more in the second half of the video the other problem i want to talk about is the way that we get this whole spider ball python thing with a lot of disinformation out there because the fact of the matter is is that you know there are some very good videos out there um new england reptile nerd uh, had an excellent video on spider ball pythons olympus reptiles had an excellent video on spider ball pythons and there was a few other videos out there from smaller channels that were also very good but most of the videos on these spider ball python was like oh my gosh like these are some not good videos not in terms of quality they might have the best editing in the world but down to the actual information the information they have was wrong okay and i think there's two aspects we're going to talk about in this podcast ignorance and then law okay let's start off with the ignorance factor and when i say that someone doesn't know what they're talking about it's not a personal attack on them it's literally just that either the conclusion that they've come to is wrong and they did not do the proper I guess due diligence is the only right word I could say to make sure that their conclusion was right maybe they took wrong steps in their procedure or when I say that someone is ignorant it means that their source that they're getting it from the source that their information is coming from is inaccurate or in itself is ignorant so let's talk about one of the biggest uh, people that have put out these videos okay this video is not to slam anybody okay I'm not gonna put out any names in this video But if you want to find out the names of these people, you can always just Google it and figure it out. So the biggest video that has been done on the spider ball pythons has almost a million views at that point. Now we can assume that some of those are repeat viewers, but that means that at bare minimum, hundreds of thousands of people's or (laughs) hundreds of thousands of people. And we know that many of them were going to be new keepers have seen the spider ball Python video. Okay. It has, like I said, about a million views and it says something like, you know, let's ban spider ball pythons or something like that. And this person, again, I think actually a decent YouTuber, I'm not going to say any names, Decent YouTuber, had some pretty good content here or there, maybe could have been a little bit better, but for the most part, some pretty good information. And then they come out and they do a video like this, okay? And in that video, there are so many incorrect assumptions, things that are just said that are absolutely not true. And I'm not talking about opinion, I'm talking about fact, okay? This is a person that has one spider ball python that is a rescue on top of that, and they're putting out this information to their platform of hundreds of thousands of subscribers, okay, putting out this information, and people are just taking it as fact, okay, let's look at one of the first problems with this, which is actually, you know, before we talk about some of the more in-depth, let's just talk about the one spider ball python that was presented in this video, okay, it was a rescue, a spider ball python, Okay, I am not a big rescue. I don't rescue a whole lot of animals, but I've taken in a bunch of animals, a bunch of reptiles specifically, from places that didn't have maybe the best care. You know, leopard geckos, anoles, boa constrictors, um, even some stuff with ball pythons, things like that. Okay, my first leopard gecko that I ever interacted with, ever owned, ever had... Okay, she was a nightmare. She was a mess. She wouldn't eat. She had to be assist fed. She was almost on the brink of death. She has metabolic bone disease. And because of all these malnutrition problems, 
not having calcium supplements and stuff like that, she has a lot of problems. Eye problems. She almost had like a tumor thing at one point that thankfully she made it out of and I removed it and she's alive and everything. Um, I mean, she's just had so many problems. And I would never look at that rescue animal and then do a video and say, you guys should never buy leopard geckos. And leopard geckos are horrible animals because they don't eat. They have eye problems and all of these things that I had with my leopard gecko because she's a rescue. Okay. I'll give you another example bow constrictor. I got a bow constrictor. He was about seven years, uh, let's say seven and a half, eight years old. Hadn't been handled his entire life. Okay. Entire life. He hadn't been interacted with barely at all. The cage wasn't cleaned very often. And it was a family that I think loved him, but he was mean from a baby. He was never tamed. So seven and a half years of being scared and afraid of people, there's no way you're going to tame that animal down. And I tried to tame him down for about a year, year and a half. And after having very little success, I actually very recently passed it on to somebody else who, I mean, maybe it's a different home, a different environment. Maybe they'll have better success. But I had a really horrible interaction with that boa constrictor. Okay, he didn't like huge enclosures. If he was in a big enclosure, he wouldn't eat very well. So we had to keep him in a smaller than I would like to um, enclosure. He was very mean, okay, hard to handle. Um, he had shedding problems here and there, and he just was not that good of an animal. Okay, but I would never go out and on that premise, on that experience, go out and say, hey guys, I'm going to do a video on boa constrictors, okay, and tell you guys that, oh, they're so, they're these horrible animals that you can't tame down, um, they have shedding problems, they don't feed in big enclosures or whatever, because I'm literally, I have one animal, okay, I have one boa constrictor that I'm basing that off of, okay, I would never do that, okay, the reason you guys never see me doing videos on like Russian tortoises or something like that is because I have no experience, and when you are trying to make a video, especially one so big and so important as a spider ball python video, and you use one animal for your example, that is literally insane, okay, in my collection here, I think I'm pretty qualified to talk about spider ball pythons, okay, I'm not the biggest breeder, of course, by any means. I'm not, I don't have thousands and thousands of animals, but I have, you know, a pretty good sized collection. We probably have, we've had over a couple dozen spiderball pythons in the collection. Um, we've sent a lot to new homes. They've all eaten, thrived, been well, and permanent breeders. I have probably 10 or 11 permanent breeders, spiderball pythons here, and I get to interact with these animals on a daily basis, okay, and these are not rescues, these are not animals that I bought as adults, these are animals that I have bought as babies and raised for the past five or even six years, I think is my oldest spiderball python that I've personally had. I have bought some adults here or there, but 90% of everything that I have are being raised from a baby, and they don't show the exact same problems. So one of the biggest things with the spiderball pythons is that when people are basing their information off of one video of one spiderball python, it's like, if you did a scientific experiment, okay, and you did it on one animal, people would literally laugh at you, okay, you can't just do it on one, okay, that's the first thing. Another thing is that a lot of these clips, not only was it somebody that, uh, again, it was multiple people that actually had just one spiderball python and did this video, not only are they're the people that are doing many of these negative videos only have like one spider ball python but then they like to use clips and they say well you know here's my spider ball python and let's look at some other spider ball pythons okay that we can find on the internet and you know you google spider ball python wobble and you can find all of these horrendous videos okay and then they just take those videos and throw them and add them as clips in their own video okay <sighs> <laughs> there are a lot of things to be addressed with this. First of all, when somebody buys a snake, okay, 99% of people do not do unboxing or reviews, okay? Most people don't, if it's a good experience. You know, I've probably sold, uh, let's say, you know, a dozen or two dozen animals, whatever it might be. I've sold a decent amount of animals over the last, let's just say, even year and a half, okay? And I've never had someone do a review on my uh, products and everybody had a terrific experience out of every animal I've sold I've only had one person come back and say that they had a problem and it was that a ball python wouldn't eat okay ball python didn't eat I told them to bump up the heat a little bit because their heat was a little low and literally the very next day the snake ate okay but I'm just trying that's a little bit off topic I'm trying to get to the point that when people have a good experience there are a lot less likely to do a, re a review 
unless they have a bad experience, okay? So when you see some of these Spiderball Python models, it's not just the average person posting their Spiderball Python. They're specifically posting this video because it's a snake that has something that's out of the norm, okay? So when you go on the internet and you grab some of these clips of Spiderball Pythons, you have to probably keep in mind that every single Spiderball Python that you see that's kind of weird, okay? Not only do we not know what kind of conditions... Uh, what kind of care that snake has been under that might have made it that way. But also you have to keep in mind that that's probably only representing one out of every 100 or 200 people that have purchased Spiderball Pythons, okay, or that own Spiderball Pythons. Most Spiderball Pythons are not like you see in these videos. But the problem is that is that the way these videos are presented, they are presented as though that is such, and that yes, indeed, all Spiderball Pythons are like this, or a vast majority. Okay, going back to the first video I talked about, you know, if there's a video out there, you can just type in Spiderball Python into Google or YouTube. It's the first video that pops up, and it has almost a million views, maybe even more than that by this point. And it says something like in the title or the thumbnail, "Let's ban Spiderball Pythons." Okay. That person, I, I try to interact with these different people, and many sp uh, anti Spiderball Python people won't even contact you back, okay, for whatever reason. It's kind of weird, but. I was looking through the uh, comment section on the community post of this specific YouTuber, and they literally had a post that was in an argument with somebody, and they said, well, mo I, they said, like, this is my ex exact quotes. I have the exact screenshot and everything. I don't know if it's still up, but they said, most Spiderball Pythons do not make it to adulthood or they don't thrive as adults, okay? And I was just shocked because I don't have this experience. I've raised a lot of Spiderball Pythons. I mean, I've never had this, and I know a lot of breeders that I've known for the past six, seven, eight years that have raised a lot of Spiderball Pythons. And we do not have most Spiderball Pythons not making it to adults or not thriving, as adults. So I was like, okay, well, where's this person getting this information from? Again, this is the exact same person that did this massive video that says, let's ban Spiderball Pythons and has about a million views, okay? He said that uh, we should basically, or that Spiderball Pythons 50% or more, which is what you mean when you say most, don't thrive as adults, okay? I tried contacting him uh, via Instagram, YouTube, wouldn't ever contact me back, okay? So I went to a business partner that this person has. I would consider them a business partner. They have a, you know, joint LLC um, partnership on a reptile um, venture. I'm not going to get into it, but I contacted that person, okay, who also did his own video on Spiderball Pythons. And I said, okay, I know you're in contact with this person as well. And he actually contacted me back. Okay, so I asked him, I said, so you guys are saying all these things about Spiderball Pythons. First of all, do you breed your own Spiderball Pythons? He said, no. I was like, okay, do you guys, are you in contact with other breeders that have a lot of Spiderball Pythons or that have um, access, to, that have raised a lot of Spiderball Pythons? I asked him, he said, no. I asked him a few other questions about this and I was like, okay, so where are you guys getting this information? Because when you go out and you make a community post that, again, it wasn't in the video, but it was a post that this person wrote, or typed, I should say, and that says, most Spiderball Pythons do not make it to adulthood or don't survive, don't thrive as adults, I think is what the exact wording was. Where are you getting this from? Okay, as a person that only owns one Spiderball Python, where are you getting this from? And I literally, again, lots of the problems is that I can look at this person and say, oh, he's ignorant, he's lying, but I don't think in many of these cases these people are um, maybe lying, okay? I think they're just inferring, okay? I think the way that they are processing their information and the sources that they're getting their information from are wrong as opposed to maybe the people that are doing the videos themselves. Uh, I still don't think you should do a video until you have your information backed up. But in this case, you know, this is a person, again, exact same guy that has about a million views on his video. I think he probably went out. He has a spider ball python that he rescued. It's pretty messed up. He went out on Google and Google's Spiderball Python Wobble and sees all of these different examples, okay? And we have to remember, we've produced literally... If I say tens of thousands, I am lowballing it big time. Probably more like over a hundred thousand Spiderball Pythons have been produced. So when you Google Spiderball Python Wobble, you're going to get some really horrendous examples. And he goes on Google and he sees all of these examples and he goes, Oh my gosh, this is a massive problem. And we have all these people with Spiderball Pythons that are adults that are also having this problem. And he bases his um, analysis in his video 
off of that information without taking into consideration that, like I said, people that have a bad experience are much more likely to post a video or um, tell people about it than have a, a good experience. And we have so many Spiderball Pythons out there that when you see 10 videos of adult Spiderball Pythons that are really crazy or have these horrendous problems, you have to remember that each bad video, there are probably a hundred or even a thousand good experiences and good um, Spiderball Pythons that people have, but they don't post those videos because there's nothing out of the ordinary. It's just like, okay, I got a snake and it thrived. That's what I expected. So it's a whole problem with the source of this information, okay? I don't even necessarily think, I'm not going to come out here and tell you guys that I think some of these people are lying or that they are trying to purposefully uh, mislead their audience. I don't think that's what it is. I think they're analyzing and they're really trying to do their best that they can for the community with this whole Spiderball Python thing, but the information they're getting and the way that they're analyzing their information is wrong, okay? It's fundamentally wrong because I can tell you right now, I've raised a good amount of Spiderball Pythons, okay? Not hundreds, but I've raised, you know, let's say in my collection, I probably have a dozen or so right now, many of which I've raised from a little tiny baby, almost out of an egg, to five or six years old, okay, and I am in contact with many breeders. I literally have breeders that I've known for the past six or seven, maybe even eight years that have their own massive collections of hundreds of ball pythons, and I've seen some of their breeders, and their breeder ball pythons, adult female spiders, or even adult male spiders, and I'm not seeing this thing, and they have raised some of these snakes. I have one guy that I know that has a spider ball python that's like 22 years old, okay, raised it from a baby, it acts fine, and he has a lot of other spider combos that are adults. It's not like he just produced them or that he bought them, and they are fine. So when I tell you guys that I, you know, have this access to this information, I'm really trying to analyze all my sources. And in this case, I'm using, um, not only am I using basically a uh, large number of spider ball pythons, but I'm trying to do it in the most accurate way possible. So again, biggest problem that we see with some of uh, the information on spider ball pythons is just that the process, people are getting the information, is um, fundamentally flawed, or the information they're getting, the source is wrong, okay? And I literally have people coming on my videos all the time, okay? Literally, all the time. I might even put just not even a video on spider ball pythons. I just post a video and there's a spider ball python in the thumbnail, or spider ball python just shown in the video. Not even if I don't even talk about the spider ball python, okay? And someone will come on and say, "Don't breed spider ball pythons. They have a wobble. They can't eat. All this stuff." And then when you ask these people, okay, many of them won't comment back to you. Many of them won't contact you back. Um, but when you do get somebody that will talk to you and you ask them, "Where are you getting this information? Do you have your own spider ball pythons? Are you in contact with?" breeders that have raised a lot of spider ball pythons, they'll say, oh, well, no, I got my information from this one video or uh, this source here. And that's, you have to analyze your sources, guys. You know, when you're going out and you're trying to tell me that my spider ball pythons, are you saying that I shouldn't breed spider ball pythons because most of them are not going to thrive as adults or that they can't eat and stuff? I deal with these snakes on a daily basis. They do eat. They actually eat probably better than a lot of the other stuff that I have in my collection. Okay, spider ball pythons, I don't know if we can prove this uh, as a genetic thing, but spider ball pythons tend to eat, especially from the baby stage, a lot better than most of the other stuff. Last year, I had one clutch of, I think it was half it was spider, or no, I produced a clutch of 10 ball pythons, six were spiders, and others, and the other four were um, snakes that didn't have the spider gene. And every single snake that took frozen thawed the fastest and ate the fastest were spiders. Okay, everything else, they did eat, but they took a little bit longer, took a little bit more effort to get them on frozen thawed. And across the board, I just see that spider ball pythons tend to have more of a um, bite first. Or, or eat first and think later mentality. And again, I don't know if we can genetically prove this, but I've actually had a spider ball python. Okay, I've never said this. And I might release a video at some point, or it might even be released before I release this podcast, whenever this comes out. I had a spider ball python once within the last few months, came out of the tub, 
okay, sensed that the Tau was kind of warm, because I dry my rodents off, my frozen thawed rodents, they're warm in a bucket, I dry them off uh, with a Tau, he looked at the Tau, saw that the Tau had a uh, uh, rodent scent on it, and that it was warm, and coiled and was trying to eat the Tau, okay, literally just like a bath towel or something you would have that I used to dry my rodents, so these spiderbell pythons obviously thrive, okay, that's a little bit of a, a rant off of the main subject, but my main point is that all these things people are saying, they're coming to me, and saying this stuff, and I literally can just say point blank, that's not true. And the problem is that your sources are not correct. And again, who is to blame and who's done what wrong? I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just trying to express a problem that we have and maybe how we can fix it. Okay, so that's on the aspect of the whole ignorance side of things. Okay, and the biggest takeaway from this is that two things. First of all, when you are dealing with something like this, you have to think about it kind of from a scientific perspective, okay? If you're going to talk about a spider ball python, you can't just use one animal, especially an animal that has had uh, maybe a rescue animal or an animal that might have had other traumas, okay? You can't use that for your uh, base source, and even still, you have to just kind of think about, go into more of the psychology of each decision that you're making before you put out a video to hundreds of thousands of people to see. Okay, that's first of all. And the second of all, also, just try to qualify your sources. Okay, make sure your sources are right and don't go out there and just post things blindly. Okay, that's on the ignorance side of things. Now, let's go to the actually more concerning side of things. Okay, because I can deal with a few people commenting on my videos, you know, spider ball pythons are this or they don't eat or, you know, whatever. But the bigger thing that has really worried me is the law side of things, the legal side of things. Because not only do most of these videos talk about, you know, all the uh, bad things about spider ball pythons, but then they say, what should we do about it? Okay, they want to come up with some sort of res resolution. And lots of these videos will say something like this. And I think I talked about this at the beginning of the podcast. They will say, the reptile industry is a business of sorts. And they'll say, basically, could you imagine if we took like the oil industry or the um, let me actually backtrack a little bit. So what happened is that when the Spiderball Python thing came out, you had multiple people, uh, Brian Barcheck, uh, New England Reptile, so Kevin McCurley of Nerd, all came out and they said, this is ridiculous, we shouldn't put out any new laws to ban the Spiderball Pythons because the industry can regulate itself, Okay, which has been proven. We regulated ourselves with uh, desert the desert gene, which if anybody doesn't know, the desert gene basically produces males that are viable, but the females are trash, they don't eat, they don't thrive. Internally, their organs are just all jacked up, and the animals are obviously suffering. So we stopped breeding desert. Not desert ghost, let me be clear on that. The desert gene, okay? Carmel albinos, okay? They are genetically kinked. People have stopped breeding those. Super cinnamons, some people still breed super cinnamons, but for the most part, people have cut down on that, and they're switching to other genes, like mahogany, that you can still get the same result, but not all the defects. So obviously, the reptile industry can regulate itself, okay? But... The people that are doing these videos on spiderball pythons said, well, that's ridiculous. If could you, And they use the analogy. Could you imagine if the oil industry tried to regulate itself? I mean, there'd be oil in the seas and they'd be destroying the environment and all this stuff. And they put out the idea that basically industries cannot regulate themselves. Okay, the reptile industry cannot regulate itself, and they're kind of alluding to, okay, if we can't regulate ourselves, what happens to businesses that can't regulate themselves? They get regulated by the government, okay, and nobody said this directly, and I don't know why, because they were all hinting at it, but when they say, we can't regulate ourselves, well, what are you pointing to? Especially when you use an example, like a big business that gets regulated by the government. They're trying to basically put out there, maybe subtle or not, that they think we should be regulated by the government, okay? That somebody should come in and, you know, let's start making laws about banning spiderball pythons. And for anybody that's going to say, oh, no, that's not what the videos are saying, that is exactly how the audience took it. Because you go and you look at all these comments and you have all these people, you know, these poor people that, you know, I don't even necessarily have anything against the people. Because, again, their information that they're getting, their sources are flawed. Not necessarily the people themselves, but you have these people that are good, genuine people, and they trust XYZ channel, and they see this video, and then they come to the conclusion that, yeah, we should go ahead and actually put in laws and legislation that bans spiderball pythons and other things like that. But, of course, there are multiple problems with this argument. Okay, first of all, the reptile industry is not like other industries. Okay, there are so many aspects that the reptile industry does not function 
like other industries. Okay, one thing that I can tell you right off the bat is that we openly talk about our secrets to success. You know, I'm not the first person to bring this up. Other channels have brought this up as well. But in most industries, if you figure out, like, let's say that the reptile industry was like other industries. Okay, if I figure out a way to get my ball python to uh, basically eat ball pythons have feeding problems if i found out a amazing trick that got ball pythons to eat i would want to save that secret and make sure it doesn't get out to other people but that's not how the reptile industry works we share that so we can help our fellow keepers and i can go on and on and on and on about the different aspects of the reptile industry compared to other industries and so to basically look at under other industries and compare them directly to the reptile industry i think is kind of foolish another thing is that the very premise on which this whole ban the spider ball python thing is based again i'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty but lots of the arguments that people have brought up okay like i talked about in the first part of this video the process at which people got their information and the way that people have drawn their conclusions about the spider gene have not been accurate okay Things like taking rescue animals and using those for your test or your um, points or taking uh, just one or two spider ball pythons and not actually evaluating a big group. Okay, lots of problems like that um, flawed the entire thing. So then to come out and say that we should make a law based on these flawed processes is just insane. Okay. I think another problem with this whole law thing is that, um, forget the point that it's unbelievably unenforceable, okay? The only way that you could actually enforce a law like this is if you had every single ball python breeder register their morphs with the state, and then you had the state be able to come in to your own private collections and then take spider ball pythons from you if you had possession of them. Okay, that's the only way. So when people say, you know, let's ban spider ball pythons and put in laws, first of all, the amount of resources that, that would take for a problem that does not exist, okay, is insane. Okay, literally having to register all of your animals with the state and giving the state that much power, okay, even the people that, you know, have put forward and said, let's ban spider ball pythons. I think that if they actually saw the power you'd have to give to the government to let them do that, I think most of those people would say, eh, maybe we shouldn't do this. Okay, so it's not just uh, a flawed thing. It's unenforceable. Okay, it's just ridiculous. And another thing that I think, you know, besides the fact that the, the logic behind actually having some system to ban spider ball pythons is absolutely insane, okay, and get rid of all the spider ball pythons, okay, also that their entire thing is flawed. Another thing is that I think people in the reptile industry, lots of people are new, okay, the reptile industry is actually ex uh, exploding in size. It was kind of a steady growth up to about 2015. And then after 2015, we have so many videos now coming out. You know, we always had like Snake Bites TV and some of our other, our other pioneers for doing the online aspect of reptile keeping. But online influence has become such a big part of not only the reptile industry as a whole, but even just like the ball python market. You know, I'm not going to get into big depth, but the ball python market was actually not doing so good in 2014, 2015. And it was only with all of this new people coming out and showing the world what they're producing that kind of launched the market to be up where it is today. Okay, I can tell you right now, the ball python industry was not doing so good back in 2015. Okay, prices were going down quite a bit. And you can say whatever you want about prices and mass production. But the ball python industry is doing a lot better now, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, than it was doing back in 14 and 15 of, you know, 2000. So that's one thing about social media. But again, that's a little bit off on a tangent, um, not exactly what I'm talking about. But my point is that the online aspect of reptile keeping has brought in so many more people, okay? There are more people uh, that have been added to the reptile industry in the past few years than there previously were. And the reptile industry, if that makes any sense. So the amount of new people that are just coming into the industry is so huge, you can't even imagine it, okay? And it's going uh, international now. It's not just the U.S. and Germany and the U.K. It is Russia, China, Indonesia, um, Thailand, all of these places, okay, where the reptile industry is booming all due to social media. But one of the problems with that is that the newcomers haven't had the struggles and the negative experiences of the old timers, okay? I can tell you right now, back in about, it, it was an ongoing thing, but let's say from 2010 
to maybe about 2014, uh, somewhere in that time, again, could be a little bit earlier, could be a little bit longer, uh, or a little bit uh, later uh, in the timeline. But basically what happened was that we had this crazy ban with reticulated pythons, Burmese pythons, and anacondas, okay? primarily Burmese pythons. If you guys probably all know, we have a problem down in South Florida where we have invasive Burmese pythons, okay? Um, most people say that they were put there by pets, and while I think there is some evidence for that, there's definitely been some color mutations that would not normally be there. The bigger thing that really boosted this thing was back in, uh, I can't remember, it, it's been a while, but one of these big hurricanes came in, I believe it was Sandy, again, I, I'm not, don't quote me on that, but one of these big hurricanes came in, and it completely tore down the infrastructure of one of the massive importers that had hundreds of Burmese ball python, or Burmese pythons at the time, and those got out into the Everglades, okay? And we all know basically what the problems are that these have caused. But the problem is that people saw this, and again, we're getting really in-depth, but there are people in the government, okay, that are anti-pet, okay? Forget anti-reptile, they are anti-pet. They don't want cats, they don't want dogs, they don't want frogs, they don't want reptiles, they don't want anything, they're anti-pet. Um, personally, I despise these people, I think they're just bored, and they don't have anything better to do with their lives, so they decide to come out and try to, um, demonize and, uh, basically put as much dirt on the pet industry as they can. Uh, PETA is also one of those guys that is really corrupt. I'm not even going to get into PETA on this thing. But basically, you had people in the government that wanted anti-pet, okay? And specifically, the reptile industry was not that big back then, not nearly as big as it was today. So to pick on them first was easiest. So they took this thing, the Burmese python, right? And instead of just banning them in South Florida, they started putting out all this propaganda. You know, I remember watching these things on the news where they would say, you know, Burmese pythons started down in South Florida, but pretty soon they might be able to take over a third of the United States. When even at that point, we had done tests in Georgia, okay, released Burmese pythons in a select area in Georgia, and zero of them survive the winter. And Georgia is just one state above Florida. So it's quite obvious that that isn't the case. But these people and the government in these different institutions saw an opportunity. Okay, and they took it, put out all this propaganda. And pretty soon you have all of these new corrupt things coming in with like the Lacey Act, trying to ban Burmese pythons, not only in Florida, but all throughout the United States, okay? And at one point, okay, many states, I'm going to say all the states, basically, there was a state or a nationwide ban, okay, where you could not transport your Burmese pythons across state lines. And many states actually enforced this kind of stuff, okay? Again, it was a really shaky thing. It was really corrupt. It was really uh, messy. So which states actually enforced what? And which laws were actually enforced is a really hard thing to determine. But I can tell you from people that I personally know that have kept lots of Burmese pythons, okay? In the states that really cracked down on this, Burmese pythons, other species, articulated anacondas, whatever, were killed, okay? Literally taken across the state lines, confiscated, found, there were raids that were done on different people's houses, and these animals were abused and literally killed, Okay, we have no numbers, we have no information on this in depth, but the amount of Burmese pythons that were literally, I mean, I mean, killed. I know people personally, not going to give any names, of course, but they have, uh, you know, their collection or their facility, whatever, is raided by X, a government or X, a uh, state organization. They come in, they take out all their Burmese pythons, and then they leave them in the cold snow of one of the northern states where a Burmese python obviously can't survive and they freeze to death, okay? Or they take them and they euthanize them, okay? And again, it's a really messy thing and I can't even say that all states did this, but I can tell you right now that Burmese pythons and some other species were literally abused and killed. These pets that people have had for, you know, maybe 20, 30 years, killed on spot because of a stupid law and a stupid crazy thing like that, okay? Thankfully, we have U.S. ARC, which uh, has done an amazing job. I mean, I cannot tell you how much um, help they have done to not only with the Burmese python thing, but with the entire reptile industry as a whole, okay? Because they don't just want to ban Burmese pythons, okay? I think U.S. ARC fought them. Originally, they wanted to add, like, Burmese pythons and boas. There was even talk of adding, like, ball pythons and stuff like that to this act. I mean, just crazy stuff. And U.S. ARC, from what I understand, sued the crap out of them, and basically they helped stop this big league, okay? 
And again, it's a very messy process, so I can't get in too much deep depth. But basically, you know, we have the situation where all of these snakes were literally killed in many instances because the government got way too much power, okay? Thankfully, the reptile industry is a lot bigger. We've learned from lots of our mistakes, and reptile uh, U.S. Ark is donated. I, I don't even know what their funds are, but I know it's hundreds of thousands, bare minimum, a year, and they have a good amount of money at their disposal to fight lots of these laws. But still, people were, things are being cracked down all the time, people. Okay, We have all kinds of new laws here in Ohio, specifically. Uh, the laws have gotten worse and worse and worse over time, but just in the entire U.S., the amount of freedom that we've had as reptile keepers is getting less and less and less and less. Back in the 60s, you could do whatever you want. Bring in venomous, you know, uh, huge... Um, you know, uh, Cuban rock iguanas, whatever. Bring in whatever you want. Okay, we didn't care. And then you get some of these people that are like anti-pet. And again, I, I am simplifying things big league. But you have these people that are anti-pet and they start putting these laws. Okay, and we're getting constricted and more and more and more. And our freedom to keep these reptiles is getting less and less and less. And the people that are new to the industry, the people that didn't experience this entire fear of, you know, what could the government do? Don't understand this. I remember when we have this entire ban going on, okay, I wasn't being, you know, I, I there wasn't too much information out online, but some of the breeders that I know had pretty close sources to this entire ban and the inner workings of it. And when I say ban, I'm talking about the Lacey Act and all those different things. And anytime I'd ask him, I'd say, hey, are ball pythons being added? Is there any talk of ball pythons being added? Because if they add ball pythons, you know, they're going to shut down the entire trade. Because what they were proposing was to make it illegal, not only in Florida to have these, but you couldn't transport them over state lines. And there was talk of ball pythons, but never got added, thankfully. And I just think this entire thing of seeing all these horrible things that the government, state and federal, have done to reptiles and the reptile industry over time, the new people don't have that fear. They don't have that, I guess, innate realization that, hey, the government is not your friend. There are people in the government that think we shouldn't be allowed to own dogs, shouldn't be allowed to own cats. There are people in the government that literally think it should be illegal to go out and touch a tortoise. There is legislation right now up in the northern states that has been floating around, okay, for the last, I think since 2018, literally saying that, like, you can't touch a tortoise. And they use just such false information. They say things like, oh, well, you should, you, if you touch a tortoise, you can get salmonella, and then you transfer it to your family, and young people can die, and just all this crazy stuff, okay? And the problem is that even the good, willing, the good-hearted people in the government that don't know a lot about reptiles, they take this and they just trust the people at face value. So when someone comes in and says, hey, we shouldn't be allowed to, uh, or they say, you know, the reptile industry shouldn't be allowed to sell tortoises and turtles because they can get salmonella from them. The good people of the government, the people that actually aren't as corrupt and don't have this whole anti-pet agenda, they look at that and go, oh my gosh, this makes sense. And just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's true. Okay, honestly, I've never heard of somebody getting salmonella from a reptile ever or any other disease, period. And I have been around a lot of reptiles myself, and I have not once gotten sick from a reptile. Okay, I've been around ball pythons specifically, but also leopard geckos, boas, I mean, just a whole boatload of species. Okay, and all this false information about, you know, Burmese pythons taking over the entire United States or all these diseases and disorders, all this stuff is all in an effort to have our freedom as reptile keepers taken away, to limit the species that we are legally allowed to keep in the United States. And the problem is that when you have these new people coming in and they see this stuff with the spider ball pythons, they think automatically, hey, you know, let's just trust the government. Let's just give the government the power to ban spider ball pythons or whatever crazy thing they're trying to propose that, again, they can't really enforce because there's no way to do that uh, unless you had like a, you know authoritarian state or whatever, but people are too easy to get on board with this because they don't know the history. They don't know all the crazy stuff that has happened with the government involved with the reptile industry, and they don't understand that as we speak, there are people out there that are anti-dog, anti-cat, and reptile industry is just a little bit easier to go after, okay? And they want to, you know, once they get the reptiles, once they get the uh, toads, frogs, lizards, snakes, whatever then they're going to go after the other pets as well. Okay, there's been so many bans, and people like PETA, uh, they release all these fake articles that, I mean, for somebody like me, or somebody that's been in the reptile industry for a while, 
You can look at these articles, look at this information, and just know it's false. But the general public doesn't know that. And I think my entire point on this last rant about the legal processes is that people just trust the government for these matters, not knowing all the bad things that can happen. Okay, again, I'm not even going to try to tell you guys how many Burmese pythons or raids were done on different facilities and how many snakes are probably killed or frozen to death or, you know, humanely uh, euthanized. I literally remember there was one case where a guy had his house raided and I think they beat the snake to death with a pole or something. It was something so ridiculous like that, okay, that they humanely euthanize them, okay, when they come in and say, you can't have your Burmese python anymore, let's take it. And could you imagine if they actually did something like this for the spider ball pythons, okay, where they come in your house and one person even used the analogy, um, they said it like child services, you know, child services is where they come in, and if they don't think your condition is right, they take your children or whatever, and reflecting that into spider ball pythons, okay? <laughs> what do you think, what is this law trying to propose? That we should somehow have some sort of force that comes in and rounds up all the spider ball pythons, takes them and euthanizes them? Okay, again, I'm not going to say that that is what all of the different YouTubers or Instagram people that are posting this false information about spider ball pythons want, but that is certainly what... Their audience is getting out of them. Go to the go to the comments on these videos. Okay, all the comments. Read them. The people are getting from these videos that hey, we should go out and we should ban them legally. There should be a law. People are out there all the time saying, hey, yeah, I agree with you, X Y Z YouTuber. These should be illegal. We should ban them and we should euthanize them and we should penalize people who breed spider ball pythons. And it's just become this massive storm of disinformation and so many just misunderstandings and there's a lot of work that the reptile industry needs to do on itself if we are going to survive i mean i think we, it's easy to get comfortable and just sit back and say hey things are always going to be like this we're always going to be able to have these amazing reptile expos we're always going to be able to have and keep these wonderful animals but that is just not the case and if it wasn't for us arc we might not have burmese pythons being freely traded across state borders it, they could have added bow constrictors or even ball pythons i know they were for sure thinking about it and they had it written down to add bow constrictors to the lacy act which means that you wouldn't be able to sell them uh you wouldn't be able to keep them in florida but you wouldn't be able to transport them across state lines which would of course bankrupt anybody who is doing uh, a reptile business with bow constrictors Burmese pythons, triculated pythons, other stuff like that, but they were also talking about, not written down, but talk of adding ball pythons. And if we sit here and we get comfortable and we just say, hey, let's trust the government. Let's just give the power to the government and let them do whatever they want with this whole spider ball python thing. I think people don't contemplate and don't understand that when you give the government, especially in some of the more northern states, which tend to be a lot more, I don't want to say, um, authoritarian but they're a lot more strict on the laws okay when you try to give the government that much power all these bad things can happen okay i know this has been a very in-depth podcast and a very um maybe more of a downer honestly because we've talked about uh, lots of the problems with disinformation in the ball python community and the last part of this podcast i've talked about all the legal things okay the legislation and what problems can occur when you give power to the government okay try to regulate an industry such as the reptile industry or the pet industry and i hope that you guys out of this podcast get that you know the spider ball python thing at its face value at face value you can look at this and just say oh well you know it's just a bunch of people arguing back and forth over whether or not something should be bred but on a deeper level it reveals some of the problems that we have with the reptile community there's nobody backing up the information that we say Okay, and thankfully, there were some great videos that came back and they counteracted lots of these negative spider ball python videos. You know, Nerd is one of them, Olympus Reptiles is another. They came out and they said, hey, this information is wrong. So for new people getting into the industry, they actually have an alternative source to listen to to help them get the best information possible. So it reveals that in a certain way, we're actually quite weak because lies and disinformation can be spread and just consumed so quickly. And also, I hope this podcast really gives light to people out there, whether you've been thinking about spider ball pythons, or um, maybe you're just new to the reptile community, and you've never heard uh, of all these horrible things that the government has done, and these snakes that have been literally killed because of these stupid acts and stupid, um, you know, Lacey Act, whatever they put, uh, and they enact in the government. And I hope this gives you guys an insight of 
why we can't ban spiderball pythons. Not only is it not... Well, first of all, again, this is going to be the end of the podcast, but not only is it not justified because the processes to gather the information to argue against spiderball pythons is flawed hugely, but also it's not, the amount of money it would take to actually get the government to do this and the amount of power you'd have to give the government, I mean, it would just end the, end, the reptile industry as a whole. And again, some people are going to look at this video and say, oh my gosh, he's going overboard, and oh, this isn't true. The government would never do that. Go back. Go through the forums. Go through these stories that people have had where their houses are raided, okay, where their uh, facilities are raided, and their snakes are taken from them and killed, Okay. Sorry for this to be such a downer video, but I hope you guys did enjoy and hopefully benefit something from this podcast. Again, my name is Benjamin, and thank you guys very much for listening to today's Benjamin's Exotics Reptile Podcast.